Hello everyone, welcome to the course Basic Cognitive Processes. I am Dr. Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur. We have been talking about attention in the last couple of lectures. Uh, we, uh, in the first lecture, we talked about visual search. We talked about uh, how you use attention to search for particular objects uh, in your environment. Say, for example, whether you follow a, a process of features, looking for specific features, whether you pro uh, follow a process of looking for combination of features, uh, and then we talked about how do you do this selection? We talked about selective attention. Today, we will talk about what is called divided attention. Now, it is no surprise, uh, you know, and it might not come as a, a novelty uh, to any of you for that matter, that we do, uh, for the most part, uh, do two things at once. Say, for example, this gentleman right here in this figure is actually driving and trying to text at the same time. And this is actually where you start misusing your capacities of dividing attention. Okay. Uh, in this particular course, we will try and see how good or a bad decision uh, something like this will be. We will talk about the fact that we can handle more than one information, more than one kind of stimulus, more than one kind of location at the same time. Yes, we can do that. We will also though talk about the limitations of being able to do that. How do we do that? What are the uh, you know uh, uh, processes involved in doing that? And how does our attention facilitate or sometimes acts as a limitation in doing two things at the same time? This one, however, is a bad example to follow. So, we'll let us move uh, towards investigating what divided attention does in a safer scenario of a particular lab. Now, one of the early works done in the area of divided attention had participants view a videotape in which they saw the display of a basketball game superimposed on the display of a hand slapping game. So, they were these uh, individuals, they were actually, you know, they were brought in front of a screen, maybe it was presented to them and they were actually looking at two activities at the same time, they were looking at a basketball game and also at the same time looking at the uh, display of a hand slapping game. Now, these participants could successfully monitor one activity and ignore the other. So, if they were told that you just focus on, uh, you know, viewing the basketball game uh, or say for example, if they were advised to just focus on the hand slapping game, they could do that very successfully. But in a third condition, if they were asked to follow both the games simultaneously and you know do some kind of uh, 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 reporting about what happened and uh, something like that, uh, they had great difficulty in monitoring both these activities at the same time. Even if the basketball game was watched by one eye and the hand slapping game by the other eye. Say, one, you, know, you can do say for example, I will uh, just uh, divide uh, uh, one of my eyes uh, to doing this, one of the eyes to doing this. I am not really sure how possible that is, but even if people would use a strategy as uh, interesting as that, uh, they were not really successful in doing that. Now, Nyssen and Becklin uh, who did this study, they hypothesized that the improvement in performance could have happened, you know, if the participants would have practiced enough. Now, as a result of practice, they would have acquired the skill of monitoring each of these games first and then each of these games simultaneously. Now, this is where your ability of divided attention comes in. Attention, we have seen that is the ability to select information and work at one information uh, and uh, one time and the other information at later, but this is a different kind of uh, thing wherein you are saying that you can attend to more than one thing, more than one uh, event or object or location at the same time. So, this is what is called divided attention. Now, in the following year, the same investigators, they used a, a dual task paradigm uh, to study divided attention during the simultaneous performance. So, earlier was observation, this is a performance task. And the two activities these uh, participants uh, were performing were uh, reading to uh, short stories and writing down dictated words. So, in one activity, they are actually uh, reading a short story and they, with the second thing, they are uh, being uh, dictated some words and they have to write that down. So, two activities are happening here. 
Now, the researchers actually would compare and contrast the response times and accuracy in each of the three conditions. What will be the three conditions? The first condition will be doing uh, the reading task, the second condition will be doing the dictation task and the third and the most important condition for our purposes is a condition wherein they are doing both of these tasks simultaneously. Now, as expected, the initial performance was quite poor across the two tasks, you know, when they had to be performed at the same time. But uh, Spelke and colleagues, they had their participants practice to perform these two tasks five days a week for around 17 weeks, total of 85 sessions in all. So, they kind of spent a lot of time practicing these two skills, reading a story, taking dictation at the same time. Now, to the surprise of many, the performance actually improved on both the tasks after practice. So, the participants were showing improvement in their speed of reading and their accuracy of reading comprehension as measured by the comprehension tests on whatever passages they were presented with. Also, they showed increases in their recognition memory for words they had written during the dictation part. So, they are kind of not only getting better at each of these tasks independently, they are getting better at performing these tasks together. So, eventually these participants performance on both the tasks also reached the same levels as when they would perform each of these tasks alone. So, that is quite an improvement in itself. Now, they could perform both of these tasks at the same time without any loss in performance on both. Say for example, if you would say that I have this 100 percent capacity of doing a particular task, if I am doing two tasks then I probably divide it 50-50. This case the participants are doing both the task at 100 percent at the same time. Now, Speck and colleagues who were doing this research of uh, you know examining these two dual tasks, they suggested that these findings are showing that control tasks can also be automatized so that they consume fewer attentional resources. Also, uh, two discrete control tasks may be optimized as a function together as a unit. Well, if you are doing two tasks together, uh, say, uh, uh, and you have practiced them enough, if you are good at them enough, you can synthesize them. You know, some people uh, study by uh, repeating, uh, you know, whatever they are reading. So, they are uh, speaking and reading at the same time and they, uh, to them, be, uh, both of them are working as a one unit task and is working pretty well. So, however, they still continue to be intentional and conscious and involve high levels of cognitive processing. It is not really taking away all their resources because they are doing two tasks. They have evolved uh, or practiced the skills as much that they both of these tasks are functioning together and they are functioning as one unit of a task. Now, a slightly different approach to studying divided attention could be involving uh, focusing on very simple tasks, very uh, you know uh, very very uh, simple tasks that require speedy responses. An example could be say for example, if people try to uh, you know uh, perform uh, overlapping speeded uh, recognition tasks like the one we do in our labs, the response for one or the both tasks are always uh, slower. So, for example, if you uh, you know if the second task begins soon after the first task started, the speed of the performance usually starts to suffer. The slowing is actually resulting from simultaneous engagement in these two speeded tasks. This slowing is called the psychological refractory period also has been referred to as the attentional blink phenomena in attention research. Now, herein is a good example. In a single task scenario, I can just ask you to spot a black X amongst these uh, you know rapid uh, serial visual presentation of grey alphabets. So, these grey alphabets will be presented one after another in quick succession, generally with a presentation time of around 75 or 50 milliseconds and then the task of the participant is to just uh, recognize whether uh, in that particular RSVP sequence uh, black X were presented or not. So, this is one kind of performance, participants generally do very well at it. Now, I can make this uh, slightly twisted and I can tell you that Okay, you have to perform, you know, spot a black X, but you also have to uh, spot a black O after that X. That might appear, not appear, might be closer to the X, lay, uh, further from the X. All of those things I would be able to manipulate, but I am giving you two tasks here. I am giving you to identify two targets, T1 and T2, again in the same uh, RSVP stream. It has been found and research has shown that the performance in identifying the second target generally suffers.
Now, findings from these PRP studies, these kind of studies indicate that people can accommodate fairly easy perceptual processing of physical properties or st sensory stimuli when engaged in a second speeded task. So, they can with practice do that as well. However, they cannot readily accomplish more than one cognitive task requiring them to choose a response uh, re to, uh, you know, uh, or retrieve information from memory or engage in various other cognitive operations at the same time. So, one or both the tasks will generally show the PRP effect, it will show the characteristic slowing down, it, will, it might show the characteristic, uh, you know, uh, characteristic uh, fall in accuracy as well. Now, let us talk about theories of divided attention, let us talk about what kind of theories uh, do uh, you know talk about divided attention. Now, a number of researchers have developed uh, capacity models of attention to understand our ability to divide our attention. So, the whole point of being able to divide attention is that you have a limited attentional capacity and you kind of divide this into two tasks which you are doing or which you intend to do at the same time. Now, these kind of capacity models explain how we can perform more than one attention demanding task at the same time. These posit uh, people have a fixed amount of attention that they can choose to allocate according to whatever task requirements. So if you are doing an easier task and a difficult task, it might be slightly easier to do it. If you are doing two equally highly demanding tasks, then it might be slightly difficult to allocate attention and manage that. Now, uh, there are two different kinds of uh, models that have been proposed. One kind of model suggests that there is only one single pool of attentional resources. So, all that sensory information that you need to negotiate with, there is only one pool of attentional resources that you would have and uh, resources can be divided uh, according to the needs of the two tasks at hand. The other model suggests that there are multiple sources of attention and there might not be a problem in, uh, nego in negotiating uh, you know, uh, the two tasks or three tasks uh, at the same time, because you can uh, say for example, uh, uh, ask different pools of attention to be allocated to different tasks at the same time. Now, these are the two kind of models, here you will see a graphic of that uh, borrowed from Sternberg and Sternberg, uh, the, their textbook on cognitive psychology. Now, in the panel A, you can see that there is one single attentional pool, whatever stimuli input are coming in, uh, part of uh, that attentional pool is allocated to task 1, part of that is uh, allocated to task 2 and then you select whatever activities you have to do, maybe press a key uh, given verbal response, whatever you want to do. This is called the single uh, resource model of attention or something like that. The second uh, uh, model if you see which is your panel B, you can find that the whatever stimulus inputs are coming in, they are actually entering in uh, via two different modalities. So, there is modality 1 and there is modality 2 and what you are basically doing is there are separate mental resources allocated to modality 1 and modality 2 and so your selection of possible activities that you have to do uh, directly follows from these two different modalities and in that sense there will be less conflict and actual responses could be uh, had later. Now, these, these are the two uh, metaphors, these are the two hypothetical uh, you know uh, assumptions, see these, these are not really uh, hard facts that attention really operates in this manner, these are two hypothetical approaches to study attention and both of these kind of theories have been tested, there have been a lot of experiments and those experiments have said a few things we will uh, you know now talk about. Now, even if you look back at these models and say for example, if you are wondering that obviously these models do uh, represent a degree of oversimplification. Uh, these models are much better uh, and it has been found that people are much better at dividing attention when competing tasks are in different modalities. Say for example, if one task is in the visual modality, the other task in the auditory modality, people have been able to do that. People have been found to do that almost effortlessly without really uh, you know slowing down or without really being too inaccurate. Okay. So, it can be said that at least some attentional resources might be specific to a particular modality, verbal or visual in which a task is presented. Say for example, you might also uh, have done it a lot of times that you will see most people uh, you know can uh, you know listen to music and concentrate on writing simultaneously. A lot of people do listen to music and drive, uh, they cannot even in, in some sense uh, you know drive if there is no music around in the car. So, people are doing two things at the same time uh, in a lot of instances and so that uh, this whole uh, concept of different modalities uh, having different kinds of attentional resources still uh, you know uh, uh, does uh, start making some sense.
Now, it is though harder to listen to the news station and concentrate ri on writing on both this, uh, you know, at the same time. Because the information coming from a particular news station is also new, might be relevant to you, you might get interested in that. So, you are kind of allocating an, uh, you know, a sizable amount of resources to that. Also, writing needs sizable amount of resources uh, and in then uh, it, it gets difficult. Another thing is that they are both verbal tasks, they are both tasks about language. So, in the language modality, uh, it might be difficult then to divide the same kind of resources that the language modality has to two language tasks at the same time, verbal tasks at the same time. Similarly, if you give somebody two visual tasks, uh, they are also more likely to interfere with each other uh, than are a visual task compared with an auditory task or an auditory task compared with a haptic task or something like that. So, within modality certainly there is this notion of capacity limitation. Within modality you uh, try and put in too many tasks, always see the finding of the PRP thing that uh, there will be that characteristic slowing down and there will be those uh, you know extra errors that will start coming in. Attentional resource theory, the ones which we have been talking about, they have been criticized uh, you know heavily as being slightly broad and vague. Resource theory uh, then in that sense seems to be a slightly better metaphor for explaining the phenomena of divided attention on complex tasks. In these tasks, practice effects may also be observed when the person gets uh, you know used to it, when the person gets highly skilled in that, in that particular task, they do, uh, they uh, become better. Now, according to this metaphor of the resource uh, theory, each of these complex tasks become increasingly automatized when you are getting good at driving and listening to music. I can uh, share one of these instances uh, which happened with me. When I started to learn driving, I used to get really uh, you know uh, uh, disturbed when somebody is playing a radio or when somebody is playing a radio on a higher volume. As and when I practiced over the you know uh, course of a few months, I got better at driving and in that sense now I do obviously listen to music while I am driving. So, as the task becomes increasingly automatized, as you scale on those particular tasks get better, the performance of each task is now going to make fewer demands on your attentional resources and in that sense both of these tasks at the same time will become more and more manageable. That is pretty much what this concept of divided attention and this whole concept of uh, resource theory tells you. Now, let us talk a little bit about the factors that might influence our ability to pay attention to two or more things at the same time. Say for example, if you are anxious, anxiety is a very important factor. If you are anxious either by nature, some people are nervous by nature, some people are slightly cautious by nature or say for example, by situation, if there is say for example, uh, something really uh, important uh, going to happen, an interview is there or some very difficult task is there or say for example, you just had a very uh, you know a bad fight with somebody but you still have to sit in a particular exam, uh, both kinds of anxiety do place constraints on attention. You will find that your uh, you know ability to concentrate on uh, even one thing for that matter, but on two things certainly becomes very very difficult. The second factor could be arousal. So arousal is basically the concept of general activity and general feeling of energy or lethargy in your body. So once overall state of arousal obviously affects and uh, uh, you know it kind of uh, impacts attention. So if you are drowsy or drugged, if you are very sleepy, uh, uh, say for example it is always said with drivers that they should be well rested if you are going for a long uh, trip, especially at the time of the night. So if you are very uh, you know. Uh, very drowsy or very uh, you know lethargic, uh, then your attentional capacities will slightly be limited. Or say for example, if you are too excited even, if you are kind of you know very very excited and if you are very happy and you know sometimes it happens with friends, your attentional capacities will slightly be uh, you know better and your uh, overall attention will be slightly better. If it is drowsy, it will be lower, if it is you are kind of optimally excited, it will be uh, you know uh, better. If you are too excited however, then also it might be a problem. Another important factor about how you can really govern your attention is that the task difficulty. Now, task difficulty particularly influences people's performance during divided. If I am giving you two uh, easy tasks to perform, you will do it very well. If I am giving you one easy and one difficult task to perform, you might still do okay. But if I am giving you two difficult tasks to be done at the same time under time pressure, you will certainly find it very, very difficult to do it. Another aspect as we saw with the you know uh, uh, experiment of uh, Speke and colleagues is that your skills uh, play a very important role. The more practiced and the more skilled 
you become in performing each of the tasks at hand the more uh, you know uh, better you will be uh, in performing two tasks two of these tasks at the same time so your attention is enhanced your processing is enhanced and better if you are performing two tasks at the same time now let us talk a little bit again about the brain and what it has to do with attention. So there is this uh, gentleman, uh, uh, very important gentleman in uh, theory of uh, uh, attention and attentional research or in most of cognitive psychology, uh, Michael Posner. He basically said that the attentional system is the, in the brain is neither a property of a single brain area and it is not the property of the entire brain as well. Posner and Mary Rothbart in 2007, they conducted a series of neuroimaging studies in uh, the area of attention to investigate whether the many diverse results of studies conducted uh, points to a common direction. So, they actually conducted a series of neuroimaging studies, fMRI studies that are in the area of attention and they wanted to investigate whether the many diverse results, because there was a lot of research going on in, in attention in the past two or three decades and they actually wanted to, uh, you know, uh, try and integrate and combine all of the, the findings from all of these studies and to say uh, whether there is a po uh, you know a unique direction whether there is some commonalities in all of this literature that can be uh, coming out so, uh, um, uh, Posner and Rothbard, they found uh, at first uh, that what at first seemed like an unclear pattern of, uh, uh, you know, results and findings could be effectively organized into areas, uh, you know, associated with three sub-functions of attention. So, they were actually looking at the brain, they were actually looking at how the brain is negotiating attention and what are the areas of the brain they are responding to various aspects and various facets of attention. So, they found that what actually looked like an unclear activation over, uh, you know, a distributed area of the brain can actually be effectively organized uh, into three sub uh, functions of attention. These sub functions they said are alerting, orienting and executive attention. Let us talk about all of these three things in more detail. Now, alerting is basically uh, that aspect of attention that uh, is uh, about, you know, being prepared to attend to some incoming event and maintaining this attention. So, alerting also includes the uh, process of getting into the state of preparedness. If uh, you know you are uh, 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 simple, you know on television there is a number going to be announced and that number is of a particular lottery and you are also having a lottery ticket in your hand, you are prepared that now this announcement will be coming up. Uh, say for example, if you are uh, you know uh, uh, sitting at airport lounges and waiting for the flight announcement or in a railway station waiting for your train announcement, you are actually prepared and alert to the possibility of that announcement being made so that you do not miss out on any uh, important information. So, that is basically what alerting is about. Now, the brain areas that might be involved in alerting are the right frontal and parietal cortices as well as what is called the locus coreleus. Now, the neurotransmitter norepinephrine is also found to be involved with the maintenance of alertness. Also, if the alerting system does not work properly, people may develop symptoms of what is called the attentional deficit hyperactivity disorder. We can talk about this in a later section, but this, in the, this is the process of regular raging dysfunctions of alerting systems and it kind of, you know, can make uh, it very difficult for people to concentrate on specific things. Orienting is defined as the selection of stimuli to attend to. If there are too many things uh, going on, if there are too many announcements being made, too many people talking around you, you might want to orient your attention to select something very specific and then listen and analyze and process that. This kind of attention is needed when you are performing say for example, visual search kind of task. Your orienting network develops during the first year of, you will see that children even, very young children uh, are also able to orient towards particular stimuli. If you clap, if you kind of, you know, give some kind of, audio, they can select to that stimuli and look at that and then maybe uh, their attention uh, fades off. Now, the brain areas involved in the orienting network are the superior parietal lobe, the temporal parietal junction, the frontal eye fields and the superior colliculus. The modulating trans, uh, tran neurotransmitter that kind of modulates the activity of this network is the acetylcholine. Now, dysfunction with this system has been associated with what is called autism. Autism is a cognitive disorder which has to do a lot with, uh, uh, you know, uh, that people uh, uh, afflicted with autism are not able to orient and attend to something or concentrate on things over periods of time. Again, we can talk about autism uh, uh, in more detail at a later point. 
The other thing is executive attention. Executive attention includes the processes for monitoring and resolving conflicts that arise among internal. Say for example, you are processing too many things at the same time, too much information is coming, you have to select to uh, that I will select this, I will select that, I will uh, you know, uh, if there is a conflict of response, all of those kind of things feelings, say for example, if there is somebody saying something, you are feeling very angry, but you suppress your anger, you still uh, start, uh, you know, continue talking peacefully, those kind of, uh, you know, social dilemmas are actually handled by this executive network. The brain areas involved in the, the, this uh, highest order of attentional processing are the anterior cingulate cortex, lateral, ventral and prefrontal cortex as well as the basal ganglia. The neurotransmitter that is involved in executive functioning is dopamine. Now, dysfunction with this kind of system, the executive attention system is associated with diseases like the Alzheimer's disease, borderline personality disorder and schizophrenia. Now, here is the figure of the brain, again borrowed from Goldstein and his textbook of cognitive psychology. You can see that what are these different networks of attention and how are they organized or scattered across the brain. We have begin this, uh, you know, uh, this chapter on uh, divided attention uh, by giving this example of distractions while driving. Now, driving is one of the, you know, I'm just going to present a very important study to you so that it kind of impresses enough uh, that, uh, you know, uh, doing something else while you're driving is uh, rather dangerous. So, driving is one of the tasks that actually require constant attention and not being able to do uh, due to, uh, the same due to fatigue or involvement in other tasks can have and does have disastrous consequences. In a naturalistic uh, observation study of driving, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, the video recorders were placed in 100 vehicles and they documented records of both, uh, you know, what the drivers were doing and also the outside view. Uh, and this was done by Dingus and colleagues in 2006. They actually found out that in more than 80 percent of the crashes uh, and 67 uh, percent of the near crashes, the driver was actually inattentive in some way three seconds prior to the crash. So, I mean, it's, it's living proof, it's experimental proof of the fact that it's very dangerous to do anything else while driving. Now, in a laboratory experiment on the effects of cell phones, Strayer and colleagues, Strayer's Williams and Johnston placed participants in a simulated driving task and that required them to apply brakes as quickly as possible as soon as a red light flashed. Now, doing this task while talking on a cell phone caused participants to miss twice as many of the red lights as when they weren't talking on the phone or they weren't doing something else. Here are the results. So, if you can uh, basically see the amount of uh, red lights missed is much higher than uh, when they were doing with cell phones and say for example, the reaction time is also much higher when they were uh, driving along with cell phones. So, this is uh, you know again experimental proof of why it is very dangerous to do anything uh, while you are driving. Strayer and Johnston concluded from this result that talking on phone uses cognitive resources. Obviously, you are listening to somebody, you are attending to the voice on the phone over all the other voices of traffic, haunts, maybe somebody from the back is uh, you know honking and wants a pass. All of those, uh, you know, you are not selecting, you are selecting this voice on the phone and that would otherwise basically, you know, that will be uh, the problem. So, you know, it takes up cognitive resources that would have been actually being used while you were driving the car. Uh, this is all. I hope I have impressed, uh, uh, you know, enough about uh, the good parts of uh, divided attention and also while the end about what the, you know, unfortunate or misuse uh, of divided attention could be. Thank you so much.